Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Viewable in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube. Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go as audio podcast edition from iTunes and other leading providers. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, you better hop on down to Amazon and pick one up. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your interest and support. And my guest today is music consultant and career coach Tom Vickers, who, among many other things, serves as George Clinton's Minister of Information during the peak 1976-1980 years of the Parliament Funkadelic Empire. In that role, he coordinated placement of publication articles, served as liaison to, uh, to five labels Clinton had acts signed to, and oversaw artwork and marketing. Subsequent to that, Vickers has staked a long and productive career in PR and A&R for major record labels like a and Capitol, and Mercury Records. Among likely in excess of the 100 artists he has been connected to are The Police, Whitney Houston, James Brown, Susan Tedeschi, Al Green, Phoebe Snow, B.B. King, Def Leppard, Johnny Lang, ZZ Top, and so many more. Having spent parts of five decades behind the scenes as an, of an industry that has undergone major changes, during that time and encountering just about every mover, shaker, charlatan, up and comer, superstar, overnight sensation, wannabe, fly by night, and has been along the way, Vickers is a repository of record business history. Just ahead, we'll see what knowledge he can drop on us, and especially deep dive into the glorious and chaotic P Funk years. So, with all that, I turn it over to you, Tom and say, Welcome. Hey, welcome, Scott, and welcome to all you uh, funk fans and uh, music lovers out there. Um, I'll try and share a few stories and keep you interested, but if you get bored, it's on you. So, <laughs> well, I really appreciate you spending the time, and you're coming to us from Los Angeles today, I believe, right? Yeah, uh, this is my sort of funk man cave here. I've got James Brown over there, and I've got George posters and pictures over there. I can't really show them to you, but um, I, I try to keep the funk alive wherever I am, and this is my little zone of maximum funkativity. Wow, I, I can feel the vibes. I'm digging it, you know, <laughs> from Charlotte to, uh, to Los Angeles. So. Yeah. All right, well, let's jump into it, Tom. So Tell me a little bit of how you um, first got interested and involved in, I, I guess maybe it was journalism first and the music second, or how did that come about? Um, basically, it was always music because I grew up outside of Boston, Massachusetts, in a town called Marblehead, which is about 20 miles up the coast north of Boston. And uh, it was the beginning of the folk boom. Uh, everybody from Joan... Baez to early Bob Dylan, all these folkies came out of Cambridge. And then that morphed into uh, sort of the blues boom because all these traditional blues artists like Mississippi John Hurt, Sun House, Skip James, Reverend Gary Davis, people like that were either being rediscovered down in Mississippi or wherever the heck they were living, or their this new generation of blues fans was finding them out. So I saw all of those people play, and then that morphed into electric blues, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Junior Wells, Buddy Guy, all the legends of that era of blues. So I saw all of them play in clubs not much larger than this room. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it went into sort of blues rock, and then – English rock because Boston was situated whenever a British band would come to the States, their first gig would be in Boston. They'd go Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, New Haven, New York, Philly, DC, and down the Atlantic seaboard. So I saw Cream with Eric Clapton mm, wow. half a dozen times, uh, Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart, all the classic English rock bands. So I had this deep love of rock but then on the soul side of things there was a station in boston a sundown i mean sun up to sundown station that would only be on 
you know, while the sun was shining called W-I-L-D. And the main DJ there was a guy named Wild Man Steve. So you could only listen to this music during the day, and I could barely get it in the vanilla suburb I was living. But I would listen to W-I-L-D, and that would give me my fix of James Brown, Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, all the great R&B soul stars of that era, you know, Wilson Pickett, Jackie Wilson, on and on and on. So on the one hand, I was getting this folk to blues to blues rock to rock experience. And on the other hand, I was getting this soul blues to soul to soul R&B to funk experience. And James Brown would come to Boston a lot the first time I saw him was in 1965. And um, I would try and see him every time he came through. And I actually had tickets to see, and I'm in a video documentary about what they call the concert to, that stopped the riot, which mm -hmm. is a very famous James Brown concert that happened in Boston the day after Martin Luther King was shot. So at any rate, saw James, many times and right after that concert that stopped the riot he came back through a year later and this i'll skip forward into a little bit of p funk but i noticed his band was just kicking ass they were so strong and i was like who are these guys and i remember at the time he was doing like sex machine and get up get into it get involved things like that and it was just like on fire so subsequently, when I met Bootsy, you know, when I went out on the road with them, first starting writing about him, uh, I asked him, were you on that show? And he said, well, when was it? And I said, 1969, 1970. He says, do you remember who the opening act was? And I said, yeah, it was this band called the Winstons. Their big hit, Color Him Father. One hit wonder act, R&B, kind of white, R&B soul mix band. Bootsy's reply was, yeah, we was on that show. I remember them mothers. I said, wow, okay. So at any rate, soul rock, it was all sort of a big interest to me. I ended up in San Francisco in 1972 to finish up college. It was sort of the leftover of the hippie ballroom era, but Winterland was open and there were all these clubs in Oakland that I'd go to. So again, it was rock and over to Oakland to a place called Ed Howard's Place to see the Delphonics or Tower of Power, East Bay Greece, or, you know, different soul fun stand-up singing acts. I didn't care. It was all good. Sly so, Stone. What's that? Sly Stone. Sly I didn't get to see Sly. I saw him subsequently, but he had sort of, moved on from the Bay Area at that point in time. So I finished up college in December of 1974. And I said to myself, well, what do I do now? You know, and I, well, I know a lot about music and I know how to write because I've been writing all these history papers in college. So why don't I write about music? And I later found out that 90% of the rock critic establishment did exactly the exact same thing. They finished college, now what? And so I started writing for this little paper in uh, Marin County called the Pacific Sun. And that was sort of a free giveaway, like, a, I don't know, in LA, the LA Weekly, or in, in New York, what the voice was for a minute. And uh, I did that. They were trying to move into San Francisco. So that gave me an entree into San Francisco. They kind of folded, went by the wayside, and then hop, skipped, and jumped to Francis Ford Coppola's magazine called City Magazine, and then from there to Rolling Stone. So I'm writing for Rolling Stone. I've been doing this now for six months. Every day, boxes of albums are showing up on my doorstep. Six, eight, 10, 12 albums per box, 30, 40 albums. It's a blessing and a curse. Yes, yes. Um, at the time, it was a blessing because I was such a music junkie. It was like getting my fix in the mail, you know? So at any rate, um, I start writing for Rolling Stone. I'm doing rock acts like Ted Nugent, 
Journey. I wrote about Journey when they were a prog rock band trying to be the Mahavishnu Orchestra. I mean, that's how they started out. And after I was there two or three months, the whole dance and disco thing was happening. And my editor, a guy named Abe Peck, said, I know you can write about this rock stuff, but do you know anything about this R&B, disco, funk world? And I said, well, yeah, I know a lot about it, and I prefer it to this rock stuff. So is there any way I could write about that? And you got to realize Rolling Stone at that point in time was sort of like the early years of MTV. Mm -hmm. They didn't show many black artists on MTV or in Rolling Stone. The only two, three, or four that made it into Rolling Stone were either blues icons like B.B. King or Howlin' Wolf or Muddy, Ike and Tina Turner. Stevie Wonder. Because the, because the role, and Stevie Wonder because the Rolling Stones anointed them as valid. Um, and that was about it. So um, my, my editor Abe said, so if you could write about anybody, who would you write about? And I said, well, how about the OJs? He goes, great, okay. They had I Love Music out at the time. So I came down to LA for the first time. I'd never been here before, and I interviewed the OJs. And they had their killer choreographer, a guy named Charlie Atkins, who started out in a tap dance duo in Harlem in the 40s and subsequently became Motown's choreographer and taught the Temps and the Supremes and everybody, Four Tops, all their steps. So I'm at the Beverly Hills Hotel, you know, this white guy, you know, with the OJs and Charlie Atkins doing these dance routines. And they're singing along to I Love Music while they're learning the steps. And it was, it was for me, it was like, fuck, I've died and gone to heaven. It doesn't get any better than this, you know? So, you know, I subsequently interviewed the OJs, and we had a whole sort of discussion, which turned into a brouhaha, because they, to my mind, as sort of a naive white guy rock critic, weren't getting any love in the album art and makeup of their uh, discs. Gamble and Huff were getting mentioned 8, 10, 12 times, but the OJs, there was no names, you, just the OJs. Well, who, who are the OJs? I don't know. So Eddie LaVert, Walt Williams, and a guy named Will, Will, William Phillips at the time were the OJs. And uh, you know, I brought this up to them, and they were like, hey, we're so happy to be having hits. You know, as long as they put the OJs on there, we don't care, you know? I didn't quite say that, but I said, you know, I think they deserve a little more love in the article. So then that turned into flying to Philly and interviewing Gamble and Hoff, spending a week in Philly, seeing MFSB, hanging out with Lou Rawls, hanging out with Bunny Sigler, going to sessions at Sigma Sound, you know, just mind blowing. Again, like pinching myself, how did I get here? You know, so this was when Gamble and Huff were in the middle of a payola scandal, which somehow they finessed and got a slap on the wrist and everything was cool. But I wanted it to be a whole story about Philly International, but it turned into a story about the payola scandal and, you know, trying to, how do I say it, make them happy, the record company happy but report on that. So it was sort of a convoluted story, but at any rate, that happened. Then Casey and the Sunshine Band, you know, uh, Silver Convention, all these different uh, disco sort of R&B, urban-y acts I'd write about, Teddy Pendergrass leaving, uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. So then one day, a stack of records shows up, open up, there's this crazy sort of ghetto art, this band like Funkadelic. Wow, let me put that aside to check out. I'd heard some of their music, but didn't know a lot about them. Then open up four or five more boxes of it. Wow, this black dude coming out of a spaceship. Wow, what's this? Put that aside. As fate would have it, the Parliament album and the Funkadelic album were right on top of each other. So. 
as I'm going through, and this was a, a thing I would do every day when all this vinyl would come in, I'd actually listen to it. So I start listening to first the Parliament album. <coughs> my head is blown. I'm like, oh my God. I'd heard Chocolate City before. I knew a little bit about George, a little bit about Parliament, but this took it to a whole nother level. Flipped out. Then I'm looking at the back cover. I'm looking at the credits. Da, da, da. I put on the Funkadelic record. I start looking at that. Well, wait a minute. These are the same guys. Do you remember this which? Is, do you remember which Funkadelic album that was? It was "Let's Take It to the Stage." They both came out within a month of each other. Yep. So I'm looking at the album copy and Pedro Bell graphics and all the names. Wait, these are this is the same band. So I'm totally blown away. Now this is pre-internet, pre-Wikipedia, pre-anything. So how do I find out more? So I, fortunately there were used record stores. One was a block or two. I live sort of on the border of the hate area. Walked down, oh, they've got six or seven Parliament and Funkadelic albums. Let me buy them. Osmium, Maggot Brain, all these different old albums go to another place, get whatever else I didn't have, America Eats It Young and two or three others, bring them back, and literally for the next week, I sit there and just listen to P-Funk and get totally, like, head blown wide open. I'm like, holy shit, these guys are incredible. So I go to my editor, dude, and I say, okay, I got my next article I want to write about. It. Who's that? This guy, George Clinton and Parliament and this other band, he's got Funkadelic. He says, two bands? Yeah, it's two bands signed to two labels with the same personnel. He said, well, that alone is worth a story, but are they doing anything? And I said, well, this Parliament album is starting to blow up. Funkadelic, they've got a single out that's making some noise. They're touring, they're selling out in the Midwest, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, go and do it. So you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and because there were two different labels, I talked to two different record publicists at two different labels and got one to pay for my flight and one to pay for my hotel. I flew out to St. Louis, where I saw them at Keel Auditorium, and this is the summer of 1976, probably around – July of 1976. So, Tom, were they uh, was Funkadelic yet on uh, Warner's or still on Westbound? They were made. They had one album left on their Westbound deal, which came out as Tales of Kid Funkadelic. Yeah. That was sort of their last album, and then <laughs> they were signed. There it is, right there. Yeah, they were signed to Warner Brothers, and they were in the process of making Hardcore Jollies when I first came on board. So, um, so there are, there's Hardcore Jollies. Yeah, one of the great Pedro Bell covers of all time. That was just fabulous. So, yeah. So that's, I got there right in the sweet spot, and this is also pre-mothership stage show. This is five months before that's about to launch. So... I meet George for the first time, and I'd seen pictures of him with the long wig and the furry foxtail outfit and the whole thing. And I'm like, you know, what's he going to be like in real life? So before the gig, we go and have sort of a preliminary, hey, how's it going? We'll hang out later, but let's hang out a little bit now. Okay, cool. And I was stunned. I mean, he was this sort of not that crazy-looking you know, African American, five foot eight, maybe guy, um, with a cro close cropped afro and uh, very fit and, and skinny because he was on the prune juice diet at that stage in his career where he drank a lot of prune juice because he said most people are full of shit and this is the way to get it out of you. So, at any rate, we hung out, we smoked a joint, we talked, you know got to know each other a little bit. And then we went to the gig together. And this is when they didn't have a tour bus, they had a school bus as their way to get around. So we get on the school bus 
and go to the gig. And um, I asked him a few questions on the way to the gig and just, you know, again, hung out. The band's all playing. I mean, the gig in the bus was better than the gig on the sh on the stage. I mean, they had little pig nose amps and Bernie Worrell would either have a little blow clavinetti or whatever those things are that you kind of blow through keyboard. I think melodica, I think you're called. What's it called? I think Melodica. Melodica, yeah. And uh, Jerome Braley had a little, you know, drum kit and this, that, and the other thing. Singing was insane. So, you know, we get to the gig and I'm like, how can this get any better? They go in and they just blow me away. And the whole the place is levitating. I mean, was a, I'm going to say a 5,000 seat Keel Auditorium. Um, not as big as a basketball place, but bigger than a small theater. And it was incredible. So now it's post-show and go back to the hotel. And now, you know, other substances are consumed and uh, it turns into a two, three hour hang with George sort of coming down after a gig, you know, that type of vibe. So we really hit it off and we're having a great time together. And he says, Oh, you got to hang with Bootsy and meet Gary Scheider and Mike Hampton. And, you know, tells me some specific guys in the group I should try to get quotes from or get to know a little bit. So the next day, as it turns out, we're going to uh, Saginaw, Michigan and we're driving. Now we flew, excuse me, we flew from St. Louis to Detroit. And then we got cars and drove to Saginaw. And they did a gig there. And um, again, as we were driving at one point with to you know from Detroit to Saginaw, I was with Bootsy and George in the car. That's when Bootsy did the Winstons. Yeah, I remember them mothers in a convenience store. And again, Bootsy, no one knew who the hell this guy was, okay? No one knew he played with James Brown. Again, there was no Wikipedia, no nothing. Nobody knew Bootsy who, you know. But this guy had so much vibe. And, you know, he dressed the way he dressed all the time then with the star, not the rhinestone, but the star-shaped glasses, usually a black leather, you know, leather outfit. And we totally hit it off. And now I've got George and Bootsy in the car driving for two hours and just like talking shit the whole way. So that was berserk. So now we're in Saginaw, they do another show and I'm supposed to go home. And George is like, no man, stick around. We're going to Gary, Indiana. Why don't you come? Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so now I'm on the mothership for real. And I'm just totally, Talking with Gary, Mike Hampton, the old Parliament dudes, Grady Thomas, uh, Fuzzy, you know, the whole thing. And it was like a circus. I mean, for a lot of more my contemporaries in San Francisco, their idea of heaven was being a deadhead and going out on the road with the dead, okay? This was my idea of heaven, and I was right in the thick of it. So... We're talking, you know, George, the whole thing. And he, he tells me about, you know, I'm about to go out with the spaceship. I'm like, whoa, you know. So I try to incorporate a little of that in the article. Article comes out three weeks after it runs, phone rings. Hey, is this Tom? Yeah. Hey, it's George. Hey, man, what's up? Hey, man, that article, it was incredible. And I said, you liked it? It was cool. And he said, cool it was everything i could hope for you know now again you gotta realize this was the only and first time george had been written up in the legitimate white rock press he'd never been in rolling stone never been in cream never been in crawdaddy never been in the village voice any of those magazines so this gave him legitimacy and credibility in sort of the white rock world because of the maggot brain and the guitar bass tunes and all that stuff. So all of a sudden, a new potential audience was opening up for him as well as 
this big, you know, spaceship tour he's about to go out on. So in the course of talking with him, he says, man, why don't you just come and work for me? And I said, George, you know, I'm a white guy up here in San Francisco. You know, he says, look, you could be a purple guy from Mars. You know what this funk is and you got to help me spread the word. I'm like, you know, I've told this story a zillion times, but I felt like Richard Dreyfus in Close Encounters of the Third Kind when the aliens say, hey, come on, what are you going to do? Say no? <laughs> yeah, you got to move. You got to do it. So I said, okay, cool. What's the deal? And he said, you know, I'll pay you a thousand bucks a month, which in 1976 would be comparable maybe to four or five thousand bucks a month today. Um, I'll move you down to, to LA and you work out of my management's office in LA. Okay, cool. So this all took about six to eight weeks to play out. But by Labor Day 1976, I was living in LA, I had an apartment, and I was driving to backstage management every day in Beverly Hills. And they lived in this area sort of near uh, Cedar sinai Hospital, residential area of Beverly Hills. And I don't know if they felt like they needed a Beverly Hills address, but all of a sudden we got complaints from all the neighbors because all these brothers are showing up at, you know, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night to hang out because not only was this an office, it also became a place for people to stay. Mm -hmm. So backstage management, unfortunately, was told, adios, muchacho, Beverly Hills. So subsequently, we moved up to the Sunset Strip. But at any rate, George was in the process at this stage of putting the whole mothership tour and show together. They were in upstate New York rehearsing the show on an air, aircraft hangar. There's video of that that yeah, is out there. And I saw some of the video, but I didn't really know what to expect. But I knew what the mothership looked like. I knew sort of the general lay of the land. But um, basically what happened was I flew to New Orleans and I'll show some graphics now myself. This is a graphic of the a flyer for the P-Funk Earth Tour in uh, 1976. And the hat is where the spaceship would, would rest during the stage show and then lower out of the hat for some of those people who didn't see any of that. Um, Here's just some other little memorabilia stuff that people might get a kick out of. Here's a ticket for a P-Funk show, uh, 1977, I think, Mother's Finest and Cameo. Um, it was in New Orleans. Yeah, 1977. That's and a nice then, <laughs> Yeah. And then here's my no head, no backstage pass backstage pass for one of the funk festivals of the summer of 77. So at any rate, those are little bits and pieces of memorabilia, but I, um, I went to uh, New Orleans where they kicked off the Mothership show on October 27th or 8th, 1976. It was at the uh, New Orleans Municipal Auditorium. And um, the deal was different people were, different record labels were taking care of different aspects of launching this thing. So again, Casablanca was in charge of hotels and whining and dining, press, radio, sales, uh, various record company people who needed to be greased, and Warner Brothers paid all the airfare. Now, it later turned out that all the airfare got paid, but Casablanca stiffed many of the hotels in New Orleans, and for a while there, we were uh, not exactly come on down when we came to New Orleans. They blamed the band, like, aren't you the guys who stiffed us last time? No, that was our label. Well, yeah, we're not crazy about you either. So 
at any rate, uh, they had a huge after party with celebrities and tons of food and blah, blah, blah. And I, at the meantime, before the show, was do doing interviews with various press people. And George and Booty were like a quote machine. It was like, you know, I mean, they're such colorful characters and so charismatic that a lot of these uh, kind of white rock critic guys, you know, they were just blown away. You know, these guys are smart. They look incredible. They've got amazing stories. So I rented a one of those uh, horse brown down horse drawn carriages to take people through the French Quarter, and I rented one for from one to five in the afternoon and i put george and bootsy in the back and i'd put one of these press people in the carriage and drive them around the french quarter for a half an hour and had it set up so every half hour there'd be a new guy they get in we go around and it was super color for their story they got a groove on talking with george and bootsy in the setting so New Orleans turned out to be the perfect place to launch the mothership. And then they played one or two more dates. And then the most famous uh, document of that era is the P-Funk Live at the Houston Summit concert that happened on Halloween, October 31st, 1976. I was at that show. The Summit was one of two two hockey style arenas in america that had in in-house camera setups there were only two cameras but we between the sound and the camera work and my co cohort archie ivy was in the camera booth doing all the cues so okay go to him now or okay he's going to take a solo or whatever so even though it wasn't a pro shoot it gives you the idea of what a p-funk show was like in that era it was mind-blowing I'm telling you, it, it took the roof off my head as well as the sucker, you know. So I had an incredible experience that night because we got a cab driver taking us to the show, and uh, his name was T-Bird, and he says, uh, you can't believe it, you know, me and these uh, two white music writers we're going to the show, and he says, "We are going. Well, we're going to go see P Funk." He said, "Oh man, I'd give anything to go to that show." Well, actually, Tom, to interrupt you, but I think the viewers also need to realize that at that time it really wasn't for the internet and all that, but the audiences for P Funk were almost 100 percent black because I went yeah. to some of those shows. Yeah, and you know, in the 80s they started crossing over, but at that time it was a totally black phenomenon. Exactly, and um, this guy was. Our, our cab driver said, you know, man, I'd give anything to go to that. And I had an extra ticket. So I said, how about free cab ride to the show and meet us and free cab ride afterwards? And I give him the ticket. And again, head blown, can't believe it. He says, I got to drive for another hour. I said, well, you're going to miss Bootsy then, but I'll meet you at the seat in, a, in an hour. Okay, great. So we go in. Bootsy does his set, and unfortunately, that is not available on a, a DVD. But if you go on YouTube and do Bootsy Houston Summit 1976, you can see that set. And as incredible as P-Funk was, and Mothership and the whole thing, Bootsy was mind-blowing. I mean, just incredible. And his, excuse me, first single big hit at the time was a thing called Psychotic Bump School. Now imagine some act having, you know, a song called Psychotic Bump School. And Boozy, psychotic, you know, and he's doing his thing. And I'm telling you, just go on YouTube and watch that, and it'll change your life if you haven't seen it already. But at any rate, Bootsy goes on, then P-Funk goes on. Now again, this is a black audience who has never seen anything like this, okay? I've seen David Bowie, I've seen Pink Floyd, I've seen, you know, some rock extravaganza acts. I know what a big stage show can be, but I've never seen anything like this, and this audience had really never seen anything like it. 
and they are just blown away. Okay, it was it was a magical experience for me, but also for the whole sixteen thousand people at the Houston summit. So now word spreads quickly. Oh man, this P Funk show, boom, boom, boom. So we're out now for another six months with the Mothership show. And in the meantime, the clones of Dr. Funkenstein album had just dropped, which there it is right there. And many of the songs on that album have been incorporated into the stage show, like Do That Stuff and- um, Dr. Funkenstein. Dr. Funkenstein, right. Game and Anya, stuff like that. So it was, musically, the show is sort of a merger of Mothership Connection and uh, clones on the Parliament side. And um, let's take it to the stage, Kid Funkadelic and sort of Funkadelic's greatest hits, Red Hot Mama, Standing on the Verge, on the Funkadelic side. Now, this is the first time I noticed that, again, I'm a white rock guy, okay? So maggot brain, I'm down. Let's go. Hit me off with Michael Hampton just shredding on maggot brain. I'm looking around at the crowd. Eh, maybe, you know, they're not feeling maggot brain so much, you know? So a lot of the, the rockier aspects of P-Funk didn't really appeal to the funkier aspects of P-Funk audience. So there was sort of a disconnect, but I was just loving it all. And what I found with the white rock critics that I bring to these shows, they would love it all too, because, you know, again, they were brought up on white rock and roll, guitars, screaming, the whole thing. So they're totally, wow, I had no idea these guys could do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And songs like Cosmic Slop, Red Hot Mama, Standing on the Verge, Maggot Brain, you know, they were like, holy shit, I had no idea, you know? So at any rate, I spent the next, I'm gonna say six months while the Mothership show was going, and then I showed you the thing of the funk festivals. In the summer, that turned into funk festivals, outdoor shows with big lineups, and we put on one here, which was the biggest show with Black. Coliseum. Yeah. And we had Brothers Johnson, Rufus and Shaka Khan. The Isley brothers were supposed to come on, but they didn't get paid. There was some pay dispute, so they didn't they didn't go on. Um, Bootsy and Parliament Funkadelic. And um, they had to bring in cranes, like construction cranes, to hang the mothership. And there's, there was a whole, I mean, the drama that went into just rigging the stage for the mothership was insane. And it, it almost didn't happen in terms of having the mothership land and all that stuff. So were they, were, were they losing money at this point doing that? Um, I, I can't tell. I don't, I don't think they were. But in consideration to how many people were there, how big the venue was, and the cost that went into putting on a show of that magnitude, they weren't making money, but the promoters were seeing this, again, in the white rock framework of we're going to make a fortune, we're going to, and they probably did because there were like 40, 50,000 people at these funk festivals. So, you know, even after all the expenses and everything was paid, Maybe the promoter walks away with 50 grand, but that's not terrible. And the band probably walks away with 50 grand. So George would hit everybody off and maybe he's, he walks away with 10 grand. But 10 grand then is 60, 70 grand now, you know? Plus you're the only large urban based act that's selling out not just arenas, but Coliseums in 1976, I mean, or 77, this now was the summer of 77. So this is pretty mind blowing stuff. You know, I gotta, you know, tell, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I had, I had a ticket to that to show that when I was in high school. Right. And, and a friend of friend mine, of mine 
stole the ticket and I didn't get to go. Oh man, that's a heartbreaker. Oh. Well, they did during that summer. They did a number of um, you know regular arena shows, but then they had I'm going to say seven, eight outdoor festival shows, and you know again this for a black audience this was mind blowing this was just a, another world there it is yeah i've got some liner notes in there a little bit and that photo is a photo i provided so um that was an amazing package it had the iron on and the poster and yeah yeah no take funk to heaven in 77 <laughs> yeah. all that stuff so while that was going on, um, in the meantime, Bootsy's blowing up. And the other thing I got to do, and this was, uh, I can't remember if this was the summer of 70, it might have been 78. I went over to the UK with Bootsy, and there's a sort of placard giveaway and we had radio as our opening act with Ray Parker Jr., who had Jack and Jill. That was his hit. And I, 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 Tom, I saw that show at the LA Forum with Radio and Bootsy. Wasn't that insane? Wasn't it was that, unbelievable. Yeah, just one of the best shows probably you ever saw in your life. It yeah. was insane. Were you at that show? I was there, yeah. Enchantment yeah. was also on the bill. Yeah, yeah. So um, Bootsy, while P-Funk's blowing up, Bootsy's blowing up, okay? And again, as much as I love P-Funk and I'm blown away that by them, Bootsy is a whole nother animal. And I have to say his band, as a band, tighter than P-Funk because he came out of James Brown school. So his shit was so tight. And his brother on guitar, Catfish, Frankie on drums, the horny horns. I mean, it was insane. So that Bootsy show you saw, I went over to England with and did about eight dates in the UK, all over like northern, the whole Northern Soul thing, Birmingham, Manchester, places like that, and then London. And I got to be really tight with Bootsy while we're on that little adventure. And so all of this is happening. And at the same time, the Horny Horns are coming out with their record. And Eddie Hazel. <laughs> Horny Horn, Eddie Hazel. Yeah, that's, that's him. And I'm doing publicity on all of this stuff and arranging interviews and advance work and all sorts of stuff. There it is. Horny Horns, my man Stozo, the artist who did that artwork. Yeah, there they both are. You got them. Yeah. So um, while all this is happening, um, I become friends with the P-Funk artist Pedro Bell, Sir Lieb of Funkadelia. And as wild and as amazing as George is and as Bootsy is, Pedro Bell is like, oh my God, this guy has vibe for days, concepts like you cannot believe. All that stuff on the Funkadelic album art that has all the great sort of stories and, and slamming other bands and what, what it means to be a maggot brain and all that type of shit, that's all Pedro. Pedro is as close to a genius as I've ever met in my life. Uh, wow. Graphically mind-blowing, verbally mind-blowing, and his ability to write, just insane. So we had the idea of putting together a fan club. And uh, we got all this fan mail. And here's a typical fan letter, Magatropolis of Funkadelia, okay? Um, and then on the back, they drew the little Funkadelic skull and the whole thing. 
yeah. and we get all these fan mail things, and they were all from high school kids or whatever. This is from a a girl named Vicky P. Your cosmical groupie, you know. And so we had this fan club that Pedro and I sort of, I'm not going to say masterminded, but we were the guys who took care of it. And he wrote all the copy, and I got all the photos, and then he did all the artwork, and I took care of getting it printed. And we spent a couple days mailing out these fan club flyers to all these kids who had joined the fan club. And we also had a um, sort of a little ID fan club membership card. I, I have some back there. But it said on one side, Mothership Travel Visa. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, Magatropolis of Funkadelica. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, I mailed them out to all these writers and you know radio people and this and that. And a friend of mine actually cashed a check in New Orleans with his, mag, you know, his Magnetropolis of Funkadelic car. So um, that added more sort of vibrational fuel to the fire, if you will. And Pedro was just an incredible character to work with. Um, here's just a few more little odds and ends. This is a press kit that Warner put out for Hardcore Jollies. And I have a poster of this, and this is one of the few posters you'll ever see a record label put out of one of their artists smoking a joint in 1976. And uh, I don't have any photos in here, but you know, I'd write all the press copy stuff that would go out with these things. So um, at any rate, all of this was going great until uh people started getting a little upset about not making enough money 